I'd like to introduce Dr. Colleen Delaney, an archaeologist and anthropology professor at CSU Channel Islands, who will discuss her recent book, Rancho Guadalasca, Last Ranch of California's Central Coast. Uh, this session will be recorded, and then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Delaney. Clicker. Do you have the clicker? Sorry. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, I'm vertically challenged, so. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks for joining me today. I'm gonna to talk about uh, Wadalaska. First, many people might ask, what is a Wadalaska? I believe it's a, and talking to some linguists, it's a Hispanization of a Chumash word. So Wadala, think, think Wadalahara. So Wada from Wadi, from Moorish, meaning canyon, or, and then La, and then the Ska at the end. The Chumash word most likely for sycamore, because Sho, I don't think I got that right, Sho is word for sycamore, and sometimes Wadalaska is written in the old records as Wadalasco. So actually, I think it's Sycamore Canyon, which is appropriate because that is the southern boundary of the ranch. So just to get us started. Um, OK. I'm an archaeologist. I work with uh, members of the Barbarian Adventuring Band of Mission Indians. So I do Chumash era sites for my main research project. But after the Springs Fire of 2013, students and I were surveying the campus hillsides and we came across this very odd looking structure. It didn't match anything else we see on campus. It doesn't match the hospital architecture. So I was hoping it belonged right, to one of the previous landowners. And that began my delving into the history of this location of Ventura County. So very brief timeline. I'm not really focusing in, in a timeline per se, but many people feel the need to put that into context. So of course the Chumash right, and their ancestors have been here for tens of thousands of years, over 10,000 years. On the campus itself where Cal State Channel Islands is and Point Magoo, the oldest sites there date back seven, probably seven to 8,000 years old. Um, and of course this was their territory and their home until they were removed by the Spanish right, in the early uh, 19th century. In 1836, Isabel Yorba, an illiterate woman from Santa Barbara, was awarded the grant, and she held on to the land until 1871, which is, you know, many people weren't able to do that. So, and, and then from then until about 1900, the focus of the area was mostly livestock ranching, primarily cattle and sheep. But starting in the late 1890s and early 1900, we see a shift in Ventura County, especially on the Oxnard Plain, towards agriculture. So we're starting to see lima bean, sugar beet production, and then eventually dis diversification. And then starting in, in um, 1930, you start seeing a breakup of some of the land. So in particular, where Cal State Channel Islands is located today, the Lewis family lost the ranch, and it's subdivided. And through time, so we've also seen the Navy base come in, Point Magoo State Park. So there's been a shift in land use over time. But most importantly for the campus area, right, it was the state mental hospital, Camarillo State Hospital from 1936 officially, although the first folks were there in 1933, um, up until uh, 1997. A short hiatus, Cal State Northridge was there briefly as a satellite campus, and then the university opened in 2002. So that's kind of the brief timeline, but I'm going to pick and choose and uh, themes and and give an overview of the history. So I really believe this is more than a timeline, right? So we can celebrate the people, events, and activities of Ventura County using the Wadalaska as our focus point. And just virtually everything that's happened in California and in Ventura County also happened here. So we can celebrate the first people, we can celebrate f resilience and fortitude, identifying racism, unfortunately, right, we see in the past, and we're hopefully changing that in the future, um, but also honor, honoring the great diversity and, uh, of people who've lived there and worked there. So, okay. All right, so to orient folks, this is the Oxnard Plain. Um, so the Wadalaska sits on the edge of it. Um, I forgot to ask if there's a pointer. There we go, oh, that doesn't work very well, the red. So here's the Oxnard Plain, where are we? We're somewhere over here. Um, so, the Wadalaska is this southern, southeastern portion. But most importantly, what a lot of folks don't realize, the Oxnard Plain has no running water. Unless it's raining, there's no running water. It was a 1% grade, and the only place you can find fresh water are where there are lagunas or springs. 
and look at that southeast side where all those blue and the aqua is, that's where there's all fresh water. And there's a few other spots, Ponum uh, near Oxnard, right? there's a few other spots throughout the plain. But in general, until Anglo-Americans came in and channelized the various areas, there was no water. And that's important because that dictates where people are going to live. Right? You need access to fresh water. So from a uh, Shumash perspective, of, for their history there, the south southeastern Oxnard Plain in particular is very important because that's where we have a multitude of fresh water sources, fresh water uh, marshes with access to basketry material, for example, and also it's at a crossroads. It's at this intersection between inland areas and the coast. So where Cal State Channel Islands is located today, Point Magoo State Park, that really was a very important part of the area for the Shumash, and in particular, all those blue dots are some, not all, of the archaeological sites we have in the area. And in particular, the sites are occupied more recently in time, the closer you get to the coast. So there's a shift through time in the orientation of the Shumash. First, they're focused more inland and in wider areas. Then once the Tamal comes in, they're focusing on the coast and long distance trade, such like that. So that red dot roughly represents Muwu. Uh, which is the historic village, and that's what, how Point Magoo gets its name. And I forgot, I always tell my students, uh, let me know if I'm speaking too quickly. I get very excited about topics, and, and then occasionally I go fast. So, so again, Muwu, the historic village. Um, many folks are unaware that the native Californians didn't have a political system the way we do, so each village is completely politically independent of each other. So it's really, that's why it's, there's so many bands and tribes today, because you're talking to an individual village, you're not talking to a whole region. But the Shumash, uh, culturally, linguistically, uh, are the similar peoples who live between San Luis Obispo and Malibu today. So that's how they're linked. But if you could say there was a, quote, political capital, Muwu, at the time of European contact, the uh, op, on top uh, individuals there controlled the religious calendar from uh, about Santa Barbara to Malibu. So they told people when, when ceremonies were gonna take place. And there was, a, there was a loose confederation of villages between some of the mainlanders and some of the islanders called Lulapin, and that seems to have been, quote, centered at Muwu. So again, bigger villages elsewhere along the coast get a lot of the attention, but I like to pull us back into Ventura County that we were a very important spot right there. And for example, Cabrillo came sailing through right in the 1540s. Oops, sorry. I'm going the wrong way. Okay. The Shumash, as I mentioned, right, were removed from their own territory, but we do have um, documentation and oral history of Shumash individuals who still stayed in the area working at the ranches. So, for example, in the middle of this picture, Cecilio Tumamite worked on the Broom Ranch, um, and his one of, at least one of his children was born there. That's his wife, Maria. Um, and we know there were settlements at Satakoy and Ventura, for example. There is a map that talks about where the Shumash workers lived uh, on what is today the campus um, as well. Um, but today at Cal State Channel Islands, we acknowledge and honor and we are um, happy to help and work with the Barbarian Adventure New Band of Mission Indians. I'd like to point out currently the, the university does not have an land acknowledgement. And we do that um, with purpose that are the Barbarino, Venturino tell us we don't want a land acknowledgement if it's just empty words. So the actions that we are doing right now with, with the BV, BMI, are we're helping to restore the trail up to Satwiwa, which is the uh, English speakers call Round Mountain. It's a sacred mountain to them. It's a place of healing, uh, winter solstice activity. So we're helping restore the path so that they can re-engage right, with the mountain. So resilience, of course, I could talk about the Shumash as far as resilience, but I like to highlight Isabel Yorba for that category, so to speak. Um, again, she was the original grantee, awarded in two parcels in 1836 and 1837, over 30,000 acres in size. And she was a woman, she was illiterate, right? And when so many folks lost the ranch, she held on to it, right? Um, a lot of text there, I'm not gonna read it all, but basically she came from a proud Californio family. Her father was one of DeFagas' volunteers. 
Her mother walked from Mexico at the age of eight on the De Anza expedition. Um, her mother was his second wife. Um, but so in, in total, they had 16 children. Um, Isabel was the oldest girl. But like, as I said, like none of the girls were educated. So she's illiterate. So there's very little we know about her firsthand. We, what we know comes from court documents. And there are some letters that she obviously dictated to somebody. But we don't have letters that she wrote. We don't have journals, things like that. But I just love to, that's why I talk about resilience. She's married at 15 and a half with a double wedding with her 13 and a half year old sister. The day after she turned 17, she and her, head, I mean, uh, her daughter's born a day after she turned 17. And within the month, the family is at Santa Barbara where her husband was transferred as an officer in the Presidio. Their only biological child, uh, Manuela, died at the age of 11. Um, and so this really puts her in an awkward position because, you know, her goal and her, her job in life was to raise a big family, right, and be there. But she doesn't have that biologically. She comes from this huge family, um, but she had many adopted children and godchildren. So she's taking care of the children of her godchildren, nephews when her sisters had died. So she has this extended network and she's fulfilling her societal role. So again, I like to point out. We, we can judge, as an anthropologist, we judge people, I think, sometimes by the culture in which they are raised. And so, so while we know the Shumash were badly treated by the Californios, this was the way she was raised, right? And she was acting in what was culturally appropriate at the time. But her, her husband, a good soldier by many accounts, except for when he was drunk. Uh, he'd been jailed several times. He was probably a wife beater. Um, and he was elected to Congress in Mexico, but died there. Um, and so what is she to do at this point? She's, um, at this point, she's approaching 40. She's got these family members that she's caring for. So she applies, right, to, for the land grant for Wadalaska. So this is the general land area. Basically, if you're familiar with Ventura County, it's the top of the Conejo grade, down to Lewis Road, down from there to the beach. It goes all the way to Magoo Lagoon. About uh, two thirds of Magoo Lagoon is part of that land parcel. From there down the coast to Sycamore Canyon and roughly all the way up the canyon up to Dos Vientos. There are other areas, but Dos Vientos is part of it. So that includes Point Magoo State Park. Um, yeah, Dos Vientos, I'm trying to think what else for highlights. The big quarry you see from Highway 101, that's all part of the land grant. So. Um, and so she petitions for it. She's, you know, she says, I've got 500 head of cattle. I need somewhere to put them. The priests of San Buena Ventura say no. And why do they say no? La Laguna, the freshwater pond that was what is today Cal State Channel Islands. They said, nope, we need that for our cattle. And she's like, nope, I can't have it without it. So they warded her all of it except the flatland where the freshwater is. She appealed, and the next year she was granted the rest of the parcel. So, really smart. So, success. And again, we have very little record, but over time she had several mayodormos, which in California in the, in the ranching days, the mayodormo is in charge. Nobody second guesses him except for the landowner. But some of them were, her, one was, her, uh, was married to her goddaughter, <coughs> uh, brother to one of her adopted girls. Dominique Abbe, and I don't speak French, Dominique Abbe uh, owned a, he and his brothers owned a mercantile in Santa Barbara, so he married one of the adopted daughters. So he was foreman for a while. Yeah. And then most importantly, which I'll talk about in a minute, but in 1860s, Patricio Bonilla um, was hired as the Mayadormo. So again, we don't know a lot, but for example, when she was applying for federal recognition by the U.S. government, one of her Mayadormos gave testimony to the, to the land case uh, court. So that's what we know. So we don't, again, we don't know a lot about her, but this was her adobe in um, Santa Barbara, De La Guerra Plaza. Um, this picture is about 1912. It was heavily damaged in the 1925 Santa Barbara earthquake. So the city tore it down for the city hall parking lot. Breaks my heart. Um, and also, if anybody's familiar with the art scene in Santa Barbara, her adopted granddaughter's husband was Alexander Harmer, a famous painter, and so it was used as his studio there in, in the 19-teens, the 1920s. Um, but large number of workers. And it must have been like the place to go, right? So even though she's a widow at this point, isn't married, she's still moving to Shaker. She's really good friends with the De La Guerra's and the, and the Carrillo's. So um, it, the, she redoes her parlor with paintings of Pompeii, with plaster. And so for $15 a month, city council meetings were held in her office. One of the De La Guerra's, Justice of the Peace, had his office in her, in her area. And she even served as a polling place, which I think is great because she wasn't allowed to vote, but it was a polling place. So she's the center, right, the center of the area there. But as I said, this is where the resilience comes in. She had to fight for that ranch. Right? Only about 25, 30% of the land grants were owned by women. 
right? And um, the, originally they turned her down. They said no, and the, you know that must have been awful. They're like, ah, nope. And she appealed again, had had more tests testimony and they and then again they're just like oh she hasn't fulfilled the requirements and she's just like I've been there for 20 years I have two adobes I've got all this stuff but finally she was able to succeed in 1857 the US federal government didn't actually patent the the ranch until 1873 all right so there's lots and lots of controversy going on there and the other thing reason it was so difficult for many of the Californios and it was the end of the ranching period was just like this past year there was an atmospheric river and so eight, December 1861 and all of January 1862, it rained basically nonstop in California, right? Central Valley was one big lake. Uh, the De La Guerra's wrote letters and they called Santa Barbara a city of paper. All the adobes were melting, right? You'd hear the crashing down of the wood lentils. Um, Isabel's house apparently was heavily damaged because they said she was down to her molars. I'd never learned that, heard that saying, about basically she's lost it all and overnight, Arroyo Las Posas, which is today Cayugas Creek, overflowed the banks at what is today Channel Islands, and the ranch workers barely made it out with their lives. So, so this then is followed by three years of drought. So this was basically the death of uh, large cattle ranching in California, at least this part of California. But she persevered. So in other areas you hear about them, oh, we had to slaughter 10,000 sheep, but we had to kill this. Not a word about Isabel having to do this. And she held on to this for another 10 years. All right. So, but you know, she's getting old. <laughs> At this point, she's close to 80. So she sells a, the northern parcel, which is Cal State Channel Islands, to her nephew for a dollar. Uh, she sells this, uh, two parcels at Magoo Lagoon uh, for eight, uh, for, sorry, for $500. Um, and then the southern portion was sold to a group of businessmen in 1871. Um, and to a group of businessmen, and then finally, um, Hollister owned it for a while, and then finally William Richard Broom. So it's been in the Broom family since 1880. There. So, but again, she managed to keep it all, and even though she sold that southern parcel for $22,000, right? Uh, she, yeah, she, her, her, all of her land owners were only valued at $14,000 the year before. So she was very shrewd. Um, but she left $25,000 in gold to four of her adopted daughters, and the Isabel House. She dies less than a month after she sells it. So I've seen the court the testimony, they had to say that she was of sound mind because she died within a week of her finalizing her will. And they said she's, she was just very frail, but she was still there. She died at the age of 82. So as a, she was a citizen of Spain, Mexico, and the United States, right? But related to the resilience, there's also tragedy. So related to Isabel, um, this is her adopted daughter, Felicidad Abade, Felicidad. Um, in May of 1868, her neighbors, the De La Guerra's, had a family, the Bonillas, living with them, and she hired the father to be her mayordomo. He was 65 years old. He has a roughly a 22-year-old son, an 18-year-old son, and much to my chagrin, as always, a daughter of unknown age or name. It's apparently not important enough, right, uh, to be documented. Um, but there was a conflict over the ranch, because I still don't understand, because Domingo had a newborn at home along with two other children, but he's living on the ranch, even though he's no longer in charge. But there's an argument over how Patricio and his boys are running the ranch. So they get into a fight, and Domingo heads to Santa Barbara to talk to Dona Isabel. And so Javier, the 18-year-old, is told by his father, okay, go, you know, you go talk to Dona Isabel. What does she want done with the ranch? As far as we know, we're in charge. Domingo had him falsely arrested in, in San Buenaventura, and he spent the night in jail. And then he was ready to go back. You know, he wanted to go on, but his, his father was like, no, 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 last night, Doña Isabel sent us a letter. She needs 60 head of cattle. The butcher needs 60 head of cattle. So they went back to the ranch. Domingo's back there, starts another fight. Guns are drawn. Domingo was killed. Javier takes for the hills. Um, and then he's brought back, so his family convinces him to come back, because obviously they didn't think he'd done anything wrong. They both had guns, they both drew, but Javier is convicted of first-degree murder. And a week before, and he was sentenced to hang. Everybody wrote letters. Oh, almost 300 residents of Santa Barbara wrote letters. The Mexican consul wrote letters. Pablo de la Guerra, the judge, wrote a letter saying, hey, he's only an 18-year-old kid. You know, the, nobody on the jury spoke Spanish? So was the testimony understood? Actually, I take that back, there was a Spaniard. But the, so the question is, did he get a fair trial? So eventually it was commuted, took a long time, he was, but he was released after 19 years in prison. Um, and I point that out because, again, it's the question of racism, what's going on here. So yes, he shot the guy, 
but did everybody understand the murder trial, the, you know, the testimony, what all's going on there? So it's an example of this conflict that was occurring in the 1860s as more and more Americans and Europeans are coming into the area and there's fewer Californios around. And I always wonder what happened to Javier and the rest of his family. A lot of them disappear. But lots of multiculturalism and diversity as we know today, um, unless so, um, we have very few um, black residents in Ventura County today, and that happened in the past as well. And I'm not a historian, so I don't, can't delve into all the demographics. But so I th personally, I think some of it relates to the fact that most, when we opened up farming, uh, most of the farmers early on, at least on the Oxnard Plain, are, were Germans and Scots. And so they're, they're working with their family members, and you don't need to have as much outside labor came, coming in. So I think that's part of it. That's not all of it. But I bring that up because I love this picture. That's the, um, to me, it appears phenotypically, right? Physically, he looks black. That, I think that might be John Mangley, who was, in 1920, was a black ranch cook here in Ventura County. Um, but that's from the Lewis family. Um, we have Japanese sugar beet workers. These folks here, this is a famous photo. Everybody knows this one from the Mulhart Ranch. But we had sugar beet farming right around, um, the, around Mountain. And in particular, uh, Japanese farmers themselves. So I like to point out they're not just workers in the fields. They're also the farmers themselves who are, who are running things. And in one case, the wife also worked in the field. So there were women in the, in the fields as well. And that lower picture, that's a doghouse. They call those doghouses. That's where the lima beans are being um, processed or dried. And I don't know if you guys are aware, maybe many of you are, uh, in the early 1900s, 75% of the world's lima beans were produced here in Ventura County. So another point of pride for us. Right? One individual that a lot of people probably don't know about, um, Chung Wong, pictured here in the middle. He was a Chinese immigrant, um, lived in Santa Barbara, so he probably got to know the Broom family. A lot of calamities apparently happened to him. In the papers, they'd say, oh no, Poor Chung Wong, yet another thing happened. Um, but it looks like for a year or two, he was actually foreman of the Broom Ranch. And he and his family moved down here. And that's his daughter, Margaret Chung, who was the first Chinese American female physician. Uh, her specialties were gynecology, surgery, and psychiatry. Um, because she couldn't get jobs because she was a woman and she was Chinese. Um, but also, she's considered an LBGTQ icon. Um, she went by the name Mike, and she wore masculine clothing while she was in medical school. So she's in this, the front row. That's when she was a sophomore. And she was actually there at a time when actually you weren't required to have a college degree. So it took her a couple extra years, but she went straight from high school to USC for that. Um, and I don't have time to talk about it, but she's considered the mother of what are called the fair-haired bastards, which were a group of military individuals. Um, but a lot of that, the reason she formed that tight connection with them, I personally think it's because of her time when the family lived in Carpinteria and on the Broom Ranch because she's out there camping, fixing fences, riding horses, hunting, and she bonded with the soldiers, with these, I'm oh, sorry, aviators over that. So you should learn more about her. Another point of pride, I think, for Ventura County is the Magoo Fish Camp. I don't know if folks are aware of this one as well. It was Japanese run by Kansaku Frank Kubota. Um, it was a very egalitarian place, and so while there's increasingly anti-Asian sentiment in the United States, you could go to the fish camp and you could hobnob with, was it Earl Stanley Gardner, and who wrote Perry Mason, um, and the vice president of MGM, and you'd have waitresses and cooks and insecticide factory workers all out there on this weekend fishing. Um, and so... Kansaku ran it from about the 19, late 19 teens until 1936. He built it up, and then and it was leased on those two parcels of Magoo Lagoon that Isabel Yorba sold. Um, and then he went late. He's in his late 40s. War is approaching, so in 1936 he heads back to Japan, and then he sells it to uh, two partners, which was the Magoo Fishing uh, Resort, Magoo Resort, and then they sell it to the to the fishing resort. Um, but multi. Um, cultural of that fishing boat. Most of those uh, guys are from the Azor Islands, so Portuguese fishermen are helping out, Japanese. So Papashima here at front, uh, that's a famous image by Lionel, Lionel Barrymore of him mending nets. He and his wife were sent to internment camps right at World War II. And I love the size of that fish. That's Marguerite Wilton. She was one of the later owners. Now, my understanding is this is called a Jew fish not religiously annotated, but because it was a jewel, so a jewel fish shortened that way. So, um, so that, those are kind of some of that's, and also our Jewish population are, in, are here in Ventura County. So a lot of folks don't know the northern parcel 
her nephew who got it for a dollar, and he's in the census records, so he actually was up here trying to make a go of it. He had to sell it to Kalisher for a $5,000 debt. But Kalisher, a Jewish businessman from LA, was very, I think, kind. It's in writing in the deed books. If he and his wife could find a buyer, they would have paid him $3,000 back instead of the five. It didn't happen. I don't know if they decided they wanted to keep the ranch. Could be, because at the same time, they opened up the first commercial tannery in Los Angeles, so you'd want your own uh, leather hides for, the, for that. Um, but Wartenberg dies suddenly, uh, and so Kalisha, I think, is forced to sell because everything was tied up in partnership. And then who buys it? Louis Loss and Louis Gersel, two Jewish businessmen from uh, San Francisco who are famous in their own right. You can go look at them. They founded the Alaska Commercial Company. Um, but they hold on to it. Both the gentlemen die suddenly, or not suddenly, apologies, uh, at, coincidentally, in 1902. And the wives hang on to the property again for a few more years until 1906. Um, they, they married sisters, which I think is very interesting. And actually, their other business partner married a sister. They all, they're all sisters from the same family. Um, so again, an, another aspect of uh, our heritage here in Ventura County that many people don't think about, right, is our, our Jewish pop, uh, residents and populations. And then another theme I like to talk about is connecting the region. So these are all some topics I'm going to briefly talk about um, in the next few uh, slides. But transportation, so the tamal, right, is, it's the Chumash are famous for their tamal. It's one of the only planked, wooden plank uh, canoe structures in the Pacific. The only other one uh, on the West Coast is down in Chile. Um, the oldest evidence of this, which is a point of pride for me, is at the village site of Somomo, which is on the Wadalaska. So the oldest evidence of the plank canoe comes from this location. Although, you know, archaeology, the thing you find, there's always things older. You never find everything. Um, but this is a very important part of pride for the Chumash. These images come from my colleague, Jennifer Perry, who was actually out on the island in 2001 with the first voyage. But today, Patagonia is working with Alan Salazar and other members of the Chumash community so that the Venturino can have their own tamal because the, one, the ones that are used now are actually a, a group of, of Chumash from Santa Barbara and Santa Inez. So, so that was very important. Those two land par parcels at Magoo Lagoon were sold to um, the good old Nelson steamship line. We almost had a steamship line at Magoo Lagoon. Um, then it became with Perkins as a partner, and then they reorganized to the um, Pacific Coast steamship line. So, but it, but it didn't work. And I don't know if it's because the land around there was too marshy, you couldn't actually get good access, or it could be that within two to three years, the piers at Ventura and Wainimi were built, and so they could have, you know, not gotten there in time. Um, and then the other slide, I love this one. A lot of folks are unfamiliar with the U.S. Coast Survey. So when the United States purchased or obtained California, they had to document all the coastlines for commercial travel, right? That was the way people traveled in the 1850s and the 1860s. And if you read, read, you read the notes of the surveyors, they viewed the West Coast as the worst assignment in the service, you know, mountains that go straight down into the ocean, months of heat, months of rain or fogs, so you can't actually make your triangulation stations. But um, they were, um, they called, was it down near Point Zuma, they were at a Sycamore, a Rattlesnake, and at Sycamore Canyon, they camped there the day of the Fort Tone earthquake. So they actually saw displacement in the Santa Clara Riverbed as they were traveling into Santa, Buen Santa Buenaventura. So rough, but, but archeologists love it because those maps are so detailed things you can't see today. Related to the Magoo Lagoon, um, but not the Japanese sport fishing camp, uh, many people are unaware of the great unnamed storm of 1939, but it's just what happened last year. Hurricane came up the coast. It was actually a hurricane for one minute off of Long Beach. Um, and the 10 days before that were over 100 degree temperatures. So you had dozens of people dying from the heat, and all of a sudden this tropical storm moved up that nobody knew was coming because there was no weather Bureau in Los Angeles. There was after this. Um, and then 48 people died out on watercraft, and there were more who died on, or, or there were a few more who died on land. But 24 of the 48 died out of one boat out of the fish camp. Um, that was the spray. And so the woman on the left was one of the two survivors. Her name was Genevieve Force. She was a waitress from Linwood. And there to the right is the widow of the boat captain. That's Kathleen Steckel. Um, so after her husband died, she sold the, her part of the resort to her to the others, the Weltons, and they held on to it until they were forced out by the Navy, right? In 
um, at the start of World War II, when they clo or at the end of World War II, they closed it. Did you know we had a railroad? The Bakersfield and Ventura County Railroad? <laughs> Pipe dream. <laughs> the guy thought he could go up through Piru Canyon and nobody could fund him, nobody would fund him. Um, but it was good for us because what happened to his rails, that rail line was already built, sugar beet dumps, right? Oh, should I have that on the next slide, I think. Um, and that's one of them, is it the next slide? Oops, I moved my slides around, apologies. But uh, sugar beet dumps and then the railway that you see today with all the cars and the bananas and things that come off the port, that's now that rail line. Let's see if I can go back again. Okay. Then we have World War II where they take over the fish camp. So this is the, a bridge that was built by them to get to the fish camp. They charged a toll to get there. Then it was the military base. So the CBs, right, construction battalion was there. And then after World War II, this also became part of the Pacific test missile range out of the Pacific Ocean. So you can see part of it there. Okay. Oh, there we go. There's the beat dumps. There was one beat dump at Satwila at Round Mountain. Okay. I still, if anybody knows any pictures of the one at Round Mountain, I would love it. I saw one source, maybe this one is the beat dump and the lower one. And also, I love that the Wadalaska bookended the major transportation routes out of the Conejo Valley. So the long grade, which is today Potrero Road, which Kalisha and Wartenberg gave the land to the county for, and then the short grade, right, which is Conejo grade. Um, a portion of that was also on the Wadalaska. Oops, wrong way, wrong way. I know this is hard to read, but I love this. This is the Southern Pacific Railroad. So when the Southern Pacific Railroad came through and leased land and bought land, they wrote this all down and they have agreements. You know, you gotta build fences. But on this top part is Lewis Sloss and wife and P. Agora. Pierre Agora, Agora Hills, leased the entire northern parcel, 8,200 acres, for at least five years in early 1900. And his great nephew uh, le lived out there as well. And they bought that parcel, which is today the quarry, that you see from Highway 01, uh, that Southern Pacific Fault bought it outright in 1918. So, so then the Agora family, so Basque sheep herders, right? Another uh, cultural heritage point to Ventura County. So Pierre, uh, uh, as I said, he leased the entire parcel. He subleased 300 acres uh, to his great nephew, John. Their daughter, Alice, was born on the ranch. And I didn't personally know of this connection until I talked to my kid's fourth grade teacher because I wanted to write kids' historical fiction. So I was talking to her about that. She's like, yeah, my mom was born out at Ram Round Mountain. She was an Agora. Turns out it wasn't her mom, it was her aunt, but you know. Uh, that. So yeah, small world, how these out. And so this is an image of the quarry. 1800, cool. And which finally gets us to probably more people, the, the people that we're more familiar with, the Lewis family. So the Lewis family bought that northern parcel, 8,200 acres, in 1906. Uh, Lewis is, um, the Lewis family is famous for sugar, um, sorry, lima beans, but before he bought that parcel, he, he worked on the Broom Ranch. He leased land there. Then he was in partnership with Adolfo Camarillo. A lot of people don't know. They co-founded the dairy together, so 23,000 pounds of butter a month. And then Lewis, for at least a few years, completely ran Rancho Callegas. He was the run, one charge in charge of it all, but then he got his opportunity to buy his own ranch, and he moved over right to the adjacent parcel. Um, so they're famous. Uh, Lewis was an inventor. Um, he built uh, equipment to uh, speed up sugar, uh, lima bean harvesting. They did new varieties of lima beans. They actually struck oil. Apparently it wasn't commercially viable because you don't hear, you don't see the oil rigs there today, but it's all in the papers in 1921, 1922. Um, they built a cannery in Camarillo and built at least 20 bungalows for the workers. Some of those houses are still there today, right off of Berry Street. And, and that location, that part of Camarillo. Um, and so I like the Lewis family. I like Joseph Lewis because he was really under the radar. So at his eulogy, people talked about so many here probably were helped by him, but you don't know it because he did, wasn't ostentatious about it. He's just like, you need help, I'll help you out, stuff like that. And I, through all this research, I actually met um, his great grandson. So some of the pictures here are from him. Uh, and I did it the wrong way again. Okay, so that's Joseph Lewis. Um, his son, Henry, on the right side, he died in a car accident on Christmas Day, 1910. But he, um, they, that's with his Pettit family uh, relatives, so one of his daughters married them. And Searles, with, with all the rabbit skins, all the dead rabbits, um, that's, his, that's the father of the gentleman who gave me all, this, all the stuff. So I, I just love that picture. He's out there hunting. 
Um, and again, the, thing that, the other thing that Lewis family represents, I think, here is the change in Ventura County agriculture. Right? So bef before they bought it, it's primarily livestock ranching. There was some agriculture. Lewis comes in, and it's a heavy, hardcore agriculture. And I know it's hard to see in the map, but each of the little areas talks about what they're growing. So they've got lemon orchards for the first time. This is from 1915. So you've got lemon orchards coming in. You've got beans. You've got uh, sugar beets. There's a, uh, grains listed in a couple other places. And uh, it's hard to tell, but that whole northern section, that's still Sfientos neighborhood up there. And then, of course, the Lewis family loses it for a variety of reasons, which I can't go into. Um, so a portion of that is bought by the state for Cambrio State Hospital. And I love the history of the hospital. I know bad things happen there. Good things also happen there. Um, but it's a city within a city. Um, we have the largest wastewater treatment plant west of the Mississippi, um, it, largest campus west of the Mississippi. Um, they had the dairy and the ranch and the farm where they um, had patients so jazz great Charlie Parker who so the drunken disorderlies were sent there Charlie Parker actually worked on the farm picking Gladys and stuff like that yeah so they had uh, housing for the doctors and the staff there in the center picture today if you've been out to quote scary dairy uh, that's the hay barn it's not the actual dairy and then that top um, right that's now the dining hall today but in 1946 for example they had 4,955 patients and that year they served 4,955,000 meals so and the vast bulk of the produce and the dairy and the and the pork for example all came from the dairy and the farm that's why they bought the Lewis Ranch all right some of that there piggery other areas okay oops go with that okay and then very briefly, a couple of folks, only because it's part of our heritage that people don't realize. Um, so the, when the Lewis family had lost it, they started subdividing. So the northern part, which is today Dos Vientos, went to Estelle and Robert Stewart. Well, within two years, three years, they are breeding national champion Percheron horses. Uh, a lot of folks don't hear about that. Um, and I, I bring up here the African-American employees because, again, I've seen all the census records. So a lot of, you know, most of the ranch workers are, uh, have Hispanic surnames, so they're Mexican or Mexican-American, um, or they're American, Anglo-American. But it's starting at this time period in the 1930s that you start seeing more black. And I, I, I go back and forth between African-American and black, but right now it seems like people prefer black. So you see more um, blacks coming, residents coming into the county from Los Angeles, right? And, and I think it really increases after the Navy base, right, after World War II. Uh, then they sell to Heinrich Wilhelm Roll um, from Germany, Lübeck, Germany, which is where I was a foreign exchange student, so I loved that little connection. Um, but he built the wharf at Wainimi. He, they built the lifeguards, or this Coast Guard station up at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base today. Um, but he was also accused of being a German spy um, because their project at Pearl Harbor <coughs> wasn't finished in time. Um, he was exonerated, it, but uh, there was other things going on there. But I just think it's funny. So it, it, again, a connection here. And then they sell to Malcolm Stewart Clark, who worked with Henry Ford. And he, he's famous for couplings, including some that are up on the space program. Um, and so he and his family held on to it uh, for a few years. And then finally, the, he sells it to Orville Lee Jaggers, who was an evangelical preacher and who claimed he had $8 million in reserves, but yet defaulted within a year and wasn't able to pay his bills. Um, and that's one of the reasons why that Dos Vientos was so long to get developed. It was because there was fighting over the property. So anyway, I just wanted to pull out a few. I just think it's kind of ironic that he wanted to build a holy city in Dos Vientos area. <laughs> back then. Uh, so and then of course Cal State Channel Islands, which I'm proud of being there. I've, uh, I've been working, this is my 17th year at, at Cal State Channel Islands, but I've been involved with the campus since it opened. All right. And then as part of that, and I just want to bring it back to the heritage, because right, heritage is more than a single person or ethnicity. It's also landscape, right? And it's others you might not recognize. So I've convinced the campus to allow me to start a campus uh, resource management team, basically an archaeology team. We do have Shumash sites on campus, but we also have some historic ranching sites, so we're helping to protect that on campus. And just uh, things you don't expect. This was part of a wall, unfortunately it's been destroyed, but they kept up this portion. So carved in wet cement of this creek diversion wall was 12741, All right? Pearl Harbor. So some hospital construction worker Pearl Harbor was attacked, and he felt the need to commemorate that. Right? So those are the kind of things I'm trying to preserve and bring more awareness to. 
And again, also with the landscape, I think it's also important to recognize the unnamed, the, un the unknown, and the unhoused. So at, out on the campus hillsides, thanks to the Springs fire, we're finding all these, I would say, unhoused encampments. Some seem to be pretty old. It could be actually just trash dumps from ranch worker housing, but some are much more recent, such as that top image. That's a cooking oil can that they probably got out of the trash from the hospital, but they took wire, and it's to get water up onto the hillsides. So we have numerous ones of these. We even found, I think, part of the lockers from the milking barn, because I found a hospital inventory tag. Also a chair with a hospital inventory tag. So these are things that people are taking up. And this was, I think, directly a result, right, of the closing of the hospital. Okay, something like that. And again, our mystery structure. So bringing it back. No, it's not the Lewis family. You know, I thought it was Guy Lewis's wife who had the affair with Frank Camarillo. I thought that was going to be their meeting spot. No. It looks like it's a 1950s work building. Um, and I also bring this up because there's a quarry. Apparently they quarried out part of a hillside in the 1950s, maybe. So, but these are the really odd things we're finding there. Most of the items date to the 1950s. So that Hudson Motor Oil can. The company went out of business in 1954. Um, so, but some stuff's people on the edge, I like to say. That, that lower hinge, that's handmade. Somebody took metal and hand cut it. Other stuff's store-bought. So it seems like some is from a work building and others people have brought in. We have bullet casings. We have kids' toys, a whiskey bottle. That's a Ballantine's whiskey bottle, right? So I think that's the quarry. So in the aerial photographs, the quarry is not there in 1948, and it is there in 1958, 1959, sorry. Yeah, so, so if anybody knows anything about that quarry, let me know. Right, so. Um, so the last thing I'd like to point out here is that uh, this barn, this is the saddle slash tack barn from the Lewis Ranch. It is the only Lewis Ranch building still there. Uh, it's there at Turning Point. And so I've been, I've mentioned hard to people to let's please try to preserve it. Right now, the folks in charge over there, the county, they're talking about turning it into a work, play, work training building for the folks there at, not Cost Pacifica, but the adult, um, housing nearby, but I wanted to bring it to you guys' attention as well. Uh, it would be good to save it. And that's uh, Searle's tally uh, in front of that building, right, somewhere between 1928 and 1930, because, um, yeah, he looks to be about between 8 and 10 there. So I think he was 10 when the family lost the business. Um, but, yeah, I think that would be an important part of our county heritage to preserve that. And I know the notice is short, but if you can make it to the campus by Friday, <laughs> I have an exhibit based on the book, right, that's on exhibit at the library. Uh, so whenever the library is open, the exhibit's open. But if you want to learn more, then I recommend the book, because, again, this was a very brief introduction to 5,000 years of uh, county history. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>